distinguished, not just Ramsey Tome, <laughs> but Ramsey Regigius Mihaloni Tome. And that was just that the story of that name is very interesting when <laughs> we won't uh, delve into it. Uh, Ramsey, he is somebody I had heard about for a long, long time. And I associated with the Hawaiian leadership, inspirational talks, um, giving uh, pules and olis at uh, big occasions, but I couldn't put it all together. And then finally I met him a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it was a great honor to meet him and a great honor to, to have you on the program. Well, likewise, Ramsey. Howard. Thank you yeah. for inviting me. It was, it was nice meeting you too, finally. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got so many interesting things to talk about. But the presentation that I heard him give used a slide with one of my favorite phrases, the elephant in the living room. <laughs> or another way of saying it is the 800-pound gorilla. Mm -hmm. And Ramsey and I were chatting, and we agree that looking at all the environmental problems, not just in Hawaii, but worldwide, and quality of life problems as well, it, the root cause is overpopulation. At the time of Christ, there were maybe a hundred million people on the face of this earth. Most of them were in the great rivers of India and China. What we think of now as the Mideast and Europe had very, very, very few people, and the Ditto, Ditto Africa. And that 100 million has now transformed into, I believe it's 7.6 billion people. And you know, we in Hawaii feel sorry for ourselves because those of us born and raised here were born with very little traffic and people, very, very courteous, slow drivers everywhere. And the tallest building, believe it or not, when I was a little kid, was Aloha Tower. Right. Yep. And so we've seen growth, growth, growth. And with that growth has come many, 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 many benefits. I personally very much enjoy living in a vibrant urban community with lots of interesting people. We have opera, we have symphony, a great art academy, so forth. So we've grown in many positive ways, but of course we've grown in some not so positive ways. And that's just us living in beautiful, beautiful Hawaii where all the world wants to come. And then you look at the majority of those 7.6 million people, and they are, in my opinion, in various stages of extreme poverty that we Americans can't even imagine. They live short, brutish lives, in the words of uh, Thomas Hobbes. Mm -hmm. And the <clears throat> warfare is going on here, there, and everywhere. And a lot of that warfare, it doesn't go get articulated, but it's about water, land, and food. Mm -hmm. We're running out of water. Uh, the country of Yemen is basically bone dry. And then Syria, it turns out, a lot of the conflict with the different groups in Syria has to do with the conflict for land. Sure. There's not enough arable land there. And they're having a drought, too, by the way. So we live, we have a whole bunch of people but a lot of those people are living in misery and air pollution. Uh, 1.6 million Chinese die every year as a result of their lungs being infected from air pollution. And we can go on and on and on sure. about the world's miseries. But um, <laughs> what do you, Ramsey, have to say about uh, the, the elephant in the living room of uh, overpopulation? Well, I you know, as we spoke earlier, I think I do agree, or we do agree, that the number of people that we have to feed, house, mm -hmm. provide health care, I mean, that number has grown immensely, and you provided us with some great numbers. Um, I like to think about it on the level of what is manageable and what's measurable for us. Mm -hmm. And so let's just take the world, and if we look at the Earth as an island, we scale that down to the island of Oahu or mm -hmm. the islands of Hawaii. I think we're experiencing the same challenges, you know. Um, depending on who you talk to and what data set you use, we were told that prior to 
Western contact, the recognized Cook arrival, mm -hmm. we had nearly as many people living here at the time. I, I we do have now estimates of a half million over 600,000. Yeah, well. yeah, and, yeah, and that's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But the difference being that we could feed ourselves, mm -hmm. right? There are housed, and granted, there were challenges. We know that we had a warring community here, but there was always a sense of balance, getting back to balance. And I think we've reached the point now where the number of people challenging these inalienable rights of air, water, land. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's add peace and prosperity to that mm -hmm. happiness. Um, it, it's getting harder to realize, mm -hmm. you know. And here in Hawaii, we acknowledge our sustainability vulnerabilities. Um, we are now facing several storms just in a, in yes, one week. Yes, yes. And you know, we can't forget the impact of these large natural disasters on communities and their ability to thrive and survive. You know, so the notion of resiliency, well, how many people can live in a small area called an island, mm -hmm. respond and be resilient, and thrive in an economy or a place where most of our food is coming from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, and though we're working on it, we have an initiative to achieve a level of self-sufficiency energy-wise by, by 2045, we're still challenged with the fact that most of our energy comes from someplace else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's all because of people. Yep. You know, and, and I'm not saying we should get rid of people, but it, I'm reminded of the joke I heard of, you know, the educator said, you know, teaching wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for all those students. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Life in the city wouldn't be so bad if it weren't for all those people. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we can do that. Yep. You know? And while I think nature has a way of correcting I think we've gotten to the point where there are some people who want to make the correction, you know, and perhaps we're seeing that in the behavior of certain governments, mm -hmm. certain philosophies and practices about who should and who shouldn't receive benefits and support. Yeah. 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 So it, 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 I think it blends into and bleeds into so many areas, policy in, in particular. Mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, this brings uh, just hearkening back to pre Captain Cook Hawaii this mm -hmm. is something you know just a teeny thing little <laughs> bit about again let's just take a conservative figure a half million people on these islands and as I understand it when the Captain Cook's men arrived on shore they were confronted with big healthy people mm -hmm. both, both men and women well fed mm -hmm. and strong mm -hmm. and the sailors who got off that ship were just scrawny guys with their teeth missing and pimples on their skin and everything yeah, like that. Yeah. that. A lot of but, uh, that had to do with long voyages. But sure, apparently sure. the Hawaiians were really, really healthy. And obviously they had problems, but uh, yeah. that boils down to a sustainable lifestyle. That, that's a phrase we overuse and overuse. Sure. But I think the Hawaiians and a lot of other island communities had achieved a sustainable uh, lifestyle. They, I think the they, yeah, yeah, they're much more balanced than we are today mm -hmm. in terms of access to food and, and the resources because they had, a, I think, a different relationship mm -hmm. with their food and their resources. Yeah. Yeah. And equally important, I'd say the notion of the maka'inana or the maka'inana, as some people say, uh, they ate fairly healthy. I mean, we did not have the sugar that we have here mm -hmm. now. I'm, mm -hmm. Ironically, we became the sugar state at one point in time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you didn't have the kinds of um, preservatives that we have in our mm -hmm. food and all the mm -hmm. other kinds of stuff, but you're eating natural foods, and in many cases, straight from the reef. Mm -hmm. So reef fish are eating right off of the reef, the limus, mm -hmm. right? Your proteins, and so you're eating a higher order food, right? So you have people who are probably much closer to a nutritional purity mm -hmm. than perhaps we are today. And we know that you know, the oranges that we receive, you need to eat a lot more of them to get the same nutritional value that we got from a single orange, maybe say 15, 20 yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, know, you have that impact of mm -hmm. uh, access as well as how food is produced. Uh, I read somewhere that when Captain Cook left the first time before he came back and, of course, uh, had that skirmish which ended his life. 
was that the community provided he and his crew with about 16 tons of food. I heard the same figure. 16 yeah. tons yeah. of food. That's yeah. a lot of food for a community mm -hmm. living mm -hmm. in, you know, on the coast of you know, South Hawaii. Yeah. Um, and when they came back, they also gave them more food, mm -hmm. you know. So you just don't give away 16 tons of food, you know, pull it out of your cupboard, you know. Yeah. Yeah. They've yeah. harvested, they've grown it. I think there's a practice. So. And then just our, our aquaculture practices. You know, at one point in time, we had, I'm told, over 300 or nearly 300 working fish ponds. Mm -hmm. They were producing anywhere between a million and a million plus pounds of food per year. Those fish ponds are no longer working. Well, we have that one on, uh, what is it, the south coast of Molokai? Yeah, uh, there's one there, and there's, yeah, of course, yeah. there's one uh, out in Kualoa, right? Mm -hmm. and they're, they're producing oysters and uh, other uh, mm -hmm. aquaponic, you know, products. But the entire system is no longer working. Yeah. You know, the fisheries that these fish ponds relied on support on, they no longer exist. They're not in the healthy state that they were yeah, at some point I, in time. I heard that those fish ponds were very, very carefully regulated. Absolutely. There was a time for this and a time for that and a time to let the fish in. And, and so That's forth. correct. Yeah. And, and once again, it's because there was a relationship with nature and the cycles and knew mm -hmm. when to do what and with whom and mm -hmm. where. So, I, you know, I think that has changed a lot. And as we're talking about populations, as populations continue to move, to follow the resources or to follow the sun, if you would, um, they challenge other places for those resources. Mm -hmm. um, in nature, we call them invasive species. You yeah. know, they come in and they take the place of others by eating what the native species mm -hmm. might eat. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the human species is any different. You know, no, this notion no. of migrating away when you've depleted the resources in your own place. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Hawaii as an international destination now we're not just on the edge of the old U.S. continental. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're out there in the middle of the Pacific. We're in the middle of a much larger economy of 22 different economies, and we have the opportunity to work with both sides of the pond, if you would. Mm -hmm. uh, so consequently, we're attracting you know, individuals who want to live in paradise. Yeah, yeah. So that, of course, impacts our population, not just those living here, but the transient population of mm -hmm. visitors, uh, Military, you know, those doing business. Mm -hmm. So it, it all places a strain on our on our natural resources. Yeah. You mentioned uh, fishing, and of course, with that goes overfishing. That's right. A lot of the world's fish are uh, pretty endangered now. And one thing I've read about is the large, large fishing boats mm -hmm. from the in, not industrial countries, but mm -hmm. those capable of the large fishing boats will go as close as they can to, say, the Micronesian islands and fish all the large fish, which affects the Micronesians' ability to catch fish in the traditional way. Sure. And that is one of the overpopulation slash uh, climate change reasons why we're getting this big influx of Micronesian people now. They, they I, I believe that's one of the reasons. I mean, there are multiple mm -hmm. reasons, of course, having to do with uh, the after effects of, of the war in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. You know, we had major impacts on their lands and agreements and things like that. But from a subsistence standpoint, clearly we've, as a world economy, looking to the ocean for our nutrition mm -hmm. and our food. Um, when you can eat anything, anytime, any day mm -hmm. that you want, you have a marketplace that is really depleting not just the oceans, but all sources of food, which means we have to find other ways, and that's why we have engineered foods now mm -hmm. entering the space, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. But as far as our fisheries are concerned, when you start overfishing and using practices that takes everything and in many cases leaves uh, the unwanted catch mm -hmm. behind to die, yeah. you're eliminating generations, future generations of catch and food mm -hmm. for the community. And it's not just happening in Micronesia. I think there are communities all over the planet who have relied on the sea, mm -hmm. who are now having to go travel farther with less resources to do it. Mm -hmm. And when they do find the fish, they're fewer, smaller, and less abundant. Mm -hmm. So, we, yeah, we are seeing multiple impacts of uh, population growth and the need for nutrition. Yeah. 
Yeah. Which, and I, I think our industry is, is really caught between is it nutrition or is it calories? Mm -hmm. Right? We have a lot of people who are producing calories through engineered mm -hmm. foods. But somehow we've engineered nutrition out of those calories. So yeah, no, we've, we've placed the priority in calories versus nutrition. That's a whole different that's another uh, conversation. topic. Let's take a little break right now and sure. be back with nutrition, calories, overpopulation, and then we can go <laughs> anywhere we want Great. from there. Thanks, Howard. Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, back in a moment. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island and the ER position. Every other Tuesday, I get to host a show here on the Think Tech program about healthcare. We call it Healthcare in Hawaii. It's really enjoyable for me to bring other healthcare leaders from around the state to talk about our pressing issues. Hawaii has long been the health state, but we need to keep up the momentum, the inertia, and with your help and with your participation, we can come and share all of the big issues that are pressing day to day. Thanks for joining us every Tuesday, alternating weeks from 2 to 2.45. Hawaii. My guest today is the Honorable Ramsey Town, and our conversation started with overpopulation. It's been going all over the place, <laughs> and one of the recurring themes that I'm seeing with us is this issue of quality of life. Yes. We do have more people, and we are feeding them, mm -hmm. and that includes uh, in beautiful Hawaii here, but we're not feeding them the, what I would call, nutrient-rich foods that our forefathers uh, ate. They ate straight from the land, and of course it was organic. And they didn't need a whole heck of a lot to eat. And it was a good balance of meat, vegetables, fruits, and some, some carbohydrates. And that has been thrown, especially for the, the lower income people, sure. it's been thrown totally, totally out of whack now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and when you go to communities that maybe um, underdeveloped, if you would, or don't have access to, uh, I guess, the finer foods. Uh, you'll find a lot of starches, a lot mm -hmm. of sugars, you know, um, because you have to feed a large family. Now, the predisposition to diseases and disorders like diabetes and mm -hmm. other things, mm -hmm. we're seeing that happen in our communities. And I think it speaks to the idea that we are what we eat. You know, so when you have to feed your family, you have to make a choice between eating and not eating. Mm -hmm. You're going to find bulk. You're going to find or look for foods that can stretch. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have a lot of that going on in our communities. And unfortunately, the Native Hawaiian community has been known, and I don't think there's any dispute, yeah. that that particular community is at the top of all the wrong lists mm -hmm. when it comes to health, yeah. uh, whether it's obesity, diabetes, and all those related you know, diseases and mm -hmm. disorders, which again speaks of nutrition versus calories. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm eating doesn't necessarily mean I'm healthy. Um, so yeah, that's something that we, we're, we're facing on a regular basis. And again, part of that is mentality, but part of it is marketing, marketplace. Um, because our ancestors, as you so aptly put, were eating fairly healthy. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't have the sugars that we have in our foods today. You're eating directly from the land. Um, you didn't have pesticides, you didn't have all those types of things. Uh, so as a result, they also didn't have immunities, right, to illnesses mm -hmm. and diseases that came from someplace else, which is what they succumbed to when they were exposed to those things. Yep, yep. And so that population died back, mm -hmm. as we talk about population, and now it's coming back. But we're coming back into a system of food very different from the one mm -hmm. we came out of. So consequently, we are... Um, adapting and adopting, you know, the illnesses and diseases related to that, that diet. And I think the marketplace would prefer that we eat certain foods when the foods that are best for us mm -hmm. nutritionally are the foods that come from the places that we come from. Yeah. Right? There's a yeah. direct co correlation between place and food. Mm -hmm. um, in Hawaiian, we say, hey, Hawaii, yao, I am Hawaii, which really speaks to the notion that I am what I eat. Mm -hmm. 
And as we spoke earlier, if I'm eating an apple from Washington and orange from Florida and some water from France and Perrier, <laughs> at what point in time in the future will my, the next generation be able to say, hey, because yeah. I'm not really eating of this place anymore. Mm -hmm. So I become a much more global person, if not internally and nutritionally, mm -hmm. perhaps mm -hmm. geographically. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we start looking like the world that we're eating. Yeah, you know? yeah. So. Yeah, for one thing that brings to mind is uh, China. Not to say anything good about uh, Chairman Mao, mm. but people were definitely living off the land at that point. They were still in their villages. They were poor as anything, but they were eating what they had available. Yeah. And now that China has prospered and internationalized, and you have all your fast food outlets around, uh, for the first time in China's history, to my knowledge, uh, obesity is a big problem, and diabetes yeah. is increasing yeah. in China. And, and I think we're seeing more of that where, you know, again, the American diet. Mm -hmm. because of the American food production system, you yep. know, the continental diet, is taking hold in different marketplaces. Mm -hmm. and in some cases, because we are traveling as Americans, and we want to eat what we want to eat when where we are. Mm -hmm. So you can go to any foreign country, and you'll find all the fast food restaurants that we have here and there, yeah. which means yeah. that those populations are now succumbing to and or adopting, you know, the eating mm -hmm. behaviors of the, the American diet. Yeah. And it's beginning to show, yeah. you know. At the same time, it has to be said that some of these countries are really beginning to say, no, we mm -hmm. don't want that, and good on them, mm -hmm. um, but it, it definitely puts a strain on the business model for those yeah. people who want to expand, you know, businesses to these foreign countries. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, just going back to uh, the, the Chinese model, as the Chinese prosper, their cities are expanding, expanding, expanding where? Onto the prime agricultural land. They're not expanding yeah. out into the desert or the swamps or anything. Yeah. So their agricultural land is shrinking while as they prosper, their appetites are growing. Yeah. So America, as I understand it, is, and, and probably Australia too, and probably Canada, they're shipping all these millions of tons of grains yeah. to China and the grains, as we know, are not the most nutritious, <laughs> especially in their process. And, and what I recently discovered was also that there is a response to rice. You know, so mm -hmm. there are communities that have traditionally grown up on rice, mm -hmm. but either the environment or the practice of growing rice has changed, mm -hmm. that it's no longer as nutritious, and people are actually having adverse effects mm -hmm. or impacts to the rice that they're eating. So, you know, now we can go into the conversation of gluten-free markets and things like that. Um, so, again, we may be a very large planet, but the globalization of everything, you know, um, we're all the same. We're all eating the same stuff now. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we're, we have a, we really don't have to look very far for those kinds of examples because it's happening right here in Honolulu, yeah. yep. you know. We're taking up the same agricultural lands that others might be doing somewhere else. And the presumption is that we can always just bring food in from someplace else. Mm -hmm. And some might argue with me, but that's the pri we've, we've stated the priority. It's, it's not a guessing game. Mm -hmm. When we decide to grow buildings on agriculture mm -hmm. land and not maintain agriculture land or growing our own food, we've stated our priority is the physical plant. Yeah. Yep. Not the plant itself. Yeah. Right? Physical plant. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to bring plants in from someplace mm -hmm. else through boxes and bags. Um, so we've e essentially maintained the, the status quo. We'll just yeah. keep on shipping food in. You know. Yeah, the uh, great best example of that occurred in today's paper with the proposed development of the area around the Dillingham Field in, mm. in the Wailua area. Yeah. And the developer wants to grow. Gen now he doesn't call it gentlemen's farms, but five-acre right. plots right. of land. And we've seen these farms from previous developments be just a mansion in the middle with maybe uh, a horse or something yeah. on the grass. Yeah. And otherwise, it's just this big uh, gen gentleman's estate. And Lucky if they even have a couple of mango trees or something. Yeah, well, that's, that's semantics, Howard. Yeah. You know, you and I both know that, right? When we say that it's agriculture, land, and farm, mm -hmm. when it's really not producing, you know, agriculture in terms of food products. Mm -hmm. But, you know, granted, you may be growing grass. You may be growing sheep, for that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all cons constitutes uh, agriculture. 
the real question is, what are we growing to feed ourselves? Yeah. You know, and I think there are enough models to say that per person, you need so many square feet or so many acres mm -hmm. per year to feed somebody. And I think if we look at that equation, we're going to find that we're quickly on the wrong side of that equation. Mm -hmm. And there really isn't any stopping it at this point in time. Well, the, the plans that we have laid on the book so far don't appear to be reversing that. Yeah. Right? So until we change our priorities to say that for every um, square foot that we take out of food production, we need to create another way of food production, whether it's on a roof or on a wall, but reframe or redefine how we use space. Mm -hmm. Um, but in such a way that we're not sacrificing nutrition and health, yeah. which I think we are. We, we, yeah. We've done and we've seen our communities, not just here but other places, succumb to those issues. Yeah. You know, that, so that's, it's, that's, it's called mindful development. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. you know? Good point. Yeah, I, I like that. The idea is that if a developer wants to take agricultural land and put it into subdivisions or whatever, or uh, part, what do you call it, strip, strip malls, mm -hmm. that they need to look somewhere else and take responsibility for producing an equal amount of food that yeah. they're taking out of production. Yeah, I, I had an elder, yeah. uh, someone elder mentioned that. He says, how do we give back an equal measure? Mm -hmm. right? How do you maintain that balance? And fundamentally, that's what aloha is. You know, aloha is to give and to receive uh, and not just to take. Mm -hmm. So I, I think if we challenged ourselves, charge ourselves to say that if I am going to take a piece of property mm -hmm. that would normally have fed a hundred people in a year's time and make that property available for a family of five to live on over the years. Well, how do those other 95 people plus those people living there going to eat now that we've taken that source mm -hmm. out? Mm -hmm. So right now that is being balanced by bringing it over in a ship or a plane, yeah. Yeah. right? But is there a way of saying that that acreage is now being placed somewhere else that we're not going we have to reserve that? And I think that it speaks to a lot of other policies, such as can we expect the right to grow my own food if I want to, mm -hmm. right? Because there are places now on the planet where policies are being put into place where you can't catch water that's come from the sky or grow for your own food, you have to buy into the system. And so mm -hmm. we may be fighting all these other stuff, but maybe one of the things we should be looking at as a community is the inherent right to grow my own food, you know, and the ability to do so. Right? Yeah, one of, one of the boards that I sit on is the Green, not Green Building, the Hawaii Building Code Council, mm. and it includes uh, the plumbing guys. And there's a big, 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 Bruhaha about the right to harvest your own uh, roof water. Right. And I remember a military family moved up onto Tantalus where they do harvest their own water. And he was not eligible for a military loan or something because he wasn't hooked up to the uh, right. supply system. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I, you know, it's sometimes we end up speaking out of two sides of our mouths. Mm -hmm. You know, on one hand, we want to be sustainable. We want to have more self-sufficiency and the capacity mm -hmm. to feed and care for ourselves. And yet, we have pressure being placed on the marketplace by offshore mm -hmm. markets that want to have access, right? Yep. Anti-trade laws and all those kinds of things. So our dairies get squeezed out. Point, so we don't yeah. have a dairy anymore, right? Mm -hmm. our, our bread producers, our, our mills, mm -hmm. all of the things that you would think a community that's feeding itself would have access to, yeah, yeah. but the external pressure from our from our own mm -hmm. right domestic economy yeah. that's pressing an island. It's it's very strange to me that something so big would rely on something so small, such as the islands of Hawaii, for their business plan. It just yeah. doesn't seem like it makes sense. And yet, we know that they're probably the most productive or busiest Costco's and the busiest McDonald's, mm -hmm. and you know up until recently. We're all here in Hawaii. Yeah, so yeah. somebody saw something happening in this international marketplace that we're in to think that something the size of Hawaii could impact the economic value to someone on the continent to okay. spend their resources and their marketing dollars 
here in the middle of the Pacific. When you think about the population and, and our impact on the GNP, it's nothing. Yeah. Right? It, but it is something. But we need to take a break. Yeah, sure. And we'll think, take away right back in a moment. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. Center Stage airs every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, and of course you can check out our archives on YouTube or on Think Tech Hawaii anytime you like. Why should you do that? Because this is an arts show that I believe is making a difference in lives. We talk with uh, artists of various ilk. We talk with painters and, and writers, playwrights, novelists, poets, sculptors, dancers, um, you name it, directors, but, uh, actors, of course. And we don't only talk about what people do, but we talk about how they do it. And my favorite part of the conversation, we talk about why they do it. And it's really common on this show to hear people say, wow, I didn't think about it that way. And it's very common to hear people afterwards who have seen the show say the same thing. And I hear all the time that people are inspired by the conversations that we have. So why don't you join us and be inspired too. That's Center Stage on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. We'll see you Center Stage. Good afternoon again for the final segment of Think Tech Hawaii Code Green. Mm -hmm. One of our many, many, many admirers out there has texted in a question. Is the issue more, issue of overpopulation, more about the growth of the population or our societal lack of concerns for others? Resources versus, versus selfishness. I think what he's getting at is the fact that in this country we're more and more the haves and the haves nots mm -hmm. and certainly in the world it is stacking up like that we have um, out of 7.2 billion maybe two one billion of us including us who mm -hmm. are very very fortunate and big consumers another billion who are pretty gosh darn well off mm -hmm. And but then you go to the lower two billion people on this planet, mm -hmm. and they live absolutely miserable lives. So, is it overpopulation or is it our lack of concern for for the misery of others? Well, I I, I don't know that they're exclusive, mm -hmm. right? Um, there is population, and I think there is a societal view of living in community, mm -hmm. right? And we refer to those as values global values but i think we've gone we've gone past the point of values because i think we all value food we all value land we value sleep mm -hmm. but some people place greater priority over priority over certain things right so we may value food but the priority of land for real estate mm -hmm. takes a greater priority and we've seen that through our policy mm -hmm. which says that you can have food but our priority is to grow the the building mm -hmm. and ship the food in mm -hmm. rather than provide the food and ship people out, right? Mm -hmm. At some point, when is enough? And I think the, the question is actually asking that question, when is enough? What is enough? Mm -hmm. And who defines that, right? And certain societies have said that, you know, we know we will not go beyond our carrying capacity. And then there are other societies that say that we have a carrying capacity mm -hmm. that defines our carrying capacity, right? And I think that's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, population is an issue, but if you have that population all subscribing to a value set and a set of priorities that says we're not going to live beyond our means, you know, and we're not going to adopt extractive practices of people and places, then perhaps we'll see a shift. But clearly, with populations growing and not being cared for in their own provinces and mm -hmm. jurisdictions, being able to travel or p to other places and place stress there, then it's, it's true. What are the societal values in those places, mm -hmm. right? And that's clearly something they were experiencing, not just in Hawaii, but in the United States at large. And our homeless population, our houseless population, yeah. uh, is, a, is a perfect example of that, yeah. you know? So yeah. I think the, the, the question is, is spot on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the very, very good question. I like that phrase. Carry, not carrying capacity, but carrying capacity. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny what two letters would do, you know? Yeah. Carrying capacity versus carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. I think if we care enough, um, not just for ourselves, but future generations, yeah. Yeah. hopefully we'll adopt policies and practices that uh, will 
produce different results, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's how we measure ourselves, not in the present, but in hindsight, right? Yeah. That back, uh, back casting, if you would, going into the future and asking yourselves, how did we get there from here? Mm -hmm. What did we do differently, you know? What behaviors did we change, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just regard to the, you call it ho houseless people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, is this, you know, we, this is the United States of America, this is the state of Hawaii, the Aloha state, and there's all these people living out on the sidewalk, including kids, as, yeah. as we're reading more and more about. I think that's the sad part, that <coughs> so much of that, uh, that homeless, houseless community are families, yeah. working yeah. families, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, by the grace of God, there go I, you mm -hmm. know, the fact of the matter is, many of us in our communities are really paycheck to paycheck, mm -hmm. you know, week to week. Um, and that is probably more common than it's ever been. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. seeing that stress and strain. So at the same time, there is growth going mm -hmm. on, right? And there's an emphasis on that term, that idea as a sign of success. Well, look at how much we've grown, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I think we have to ask ourselves that question, is really growth the answer? Is that really the variable of success? Yeah, growth, gro growth of number of people, <clears throat> and growth of individual uh, wealth. Right. Yeah. Well, there's replacement and then there's mm -hmm. displacement, right? And I think we can grow, mm -hmm. uh, add to our population, and perhaps even find convenient ways of, of dealing with and their issues and their needs. But in the process of doing that, who have we displaced or what mm -hmm. have we displaced? Mm -hmm. Where they're part of nature or they're part of our communities. And I think we're at that point right now where we're seeing that displacement occur. And yet we've languaged in such a way because we've placed priority on, well, it provides jobs, uh, and we want everyone to be educated. To what end? You know? Mm -hmm. The means have become the ends in many ways. And so I think we're challenged as a community to really have these kind of conversations, table to table, home to home, and really begin to ask ourselves, what are our priorities? This isn't anti-business any more than it is anti-community. Yeah, yeah. But it's fun. Where's the balance? Where's the equilibrium? Mm -hmm. You know, when do we really uh, challenge ourselves to to test our policies against something yeah, other than question. the ones we're using yeah. now? Right. Well, you know, right under our noses is the community of uh, Kaka'ako. That's right. Many, many years ago, I had uh, a small business with a couple other people, and mm -hmm. we our office was in Kaka'ako, and that was a kind of a <clears throat> a blue collar, light industrial paradise mm -hmm. back then. There was all these auto paint shops and repair shops and little warehouses, and then people would kind of illegally rent out <laughs> part of the warehouse, yeah. and people would just live there, and there was a restroom down the hall. Yeah. And <clears throat> it turns out it housed, Kakako housed thousands and thousands of people, provided thousands and thousands of jobs, yeah. Yeah. and now it's just going up, 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 up. And I spent a lot of time again in Kakaako in a different capacity, and most of the people I see going into those luxurious high-rises are not from Hawaii. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, th and that mm -hmm. is one of the challenges. We've become, we've attracted that kind of, mm -hmm. you know, attention from those who have capacity. And on one hand, that's great for the overall economy because we're introducing dollars that weren't here before. Yeah. But again, what are we displacing or replacing as a result of that? Yeah, we, we displace all those um, sort of middle and lower level blue collar people who yeah. were Kaka -ka was their home. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we, we said it in our plans that we wanted to go to compact design. Mm -hmm. And so we could easily say, well, that's what this is, right? Versus density. Mm -hmm. And yet the original plans for that area were intended to reduce or prevent sprawl. Mm -hmm. But it's happening after the sprawl has already taken yeah. place. So that's no yeah. longer <laughs> that's no longer the argument. Mm -hmm. The the real question is, well that yeah, okay, so we're we're doing compact design. We got more people in one area going up. Um, how many more? What mm -hmm. is the carrying capacity, yeah, yeah, yeah. because we could easily become Hong Kong or Singapore. You can get a lot of people in on a, sta on a you know, post stamp if you want, mm -hmm. but what's the quality of life look like? What yeah. does Hawaii look like? Mm -hmm. You know, um, even from a visitor standpoint, we've got seven to eight million people coming annually now. With the Chinese market growing and the number of people mm -hmm. going to be able to travel on visas, 
how many more do we want to come to Hawaii? Or how much can we handle? Mm -hmm. uh, aside from the social impacts, just the environmental impacts alone. What would this place look like? You know, and that was one of the issues from a futuristic standpoint. We challenged ourselves at the Tim School multiple years ago. How many more people can we take? What would that look like? What's optimal? Yeah. So once again, we come back to the question, what's enough? When mm -hmm. is enough mm -hmm. enough? And I don't, I don't have the answer. I'm not sure anyone. But I think we all know that when the tree is no longer there that used to provide us shade, and we can no longer drink water out of the stream or let our kids play in paradise in the river, mm -hmm. which I think many of us did as children. Yeah, I, I certainly did, yeah. We have to ask the question. You know, this growth and progress is really, you know, really changing our, our lifestyle mm -hmm. um, and our quality of life. It does come down to quality of life index. Well, you know, the... This gets, we only have a few minutes, sure. but uh, we talked about population growth. And in addition to that, there's the economic growth of, of mm -hmm. the individual. Mm -hmm. And people are wooing <clears throat> and wringing their hands over Japan because its economy has been stable for, what, since 1990, mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. It's not growing. But I now spend a good, good, good deal of time in Waikiki. And I see all these very happy Japanese tourists, very often young couples with their little kids, and they're going from shop to shop, restaurant mm -hmm. to restaurant, and they look pretty darn uh, happy to me. Yeah. So, but they have a stable economy. That's terrible. What will the, the Wall Street Journal <laughs> <interest? laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's all about currencies, right? The currency mm -hmm. of exchange. And, you know, what have we exchanged in order to access that currency? Mm -hmm. And I think we've exchanged a lot. We've, we've given up a lot. We've shifted and changed a lot uh, in order to be in alignment with that currency. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, most currencies, cash currency is challenged, as we all know. I don't think there's a debate about that. Um, but there are a lot of banks that are, are going under, meaning the natural bank, the cultural bank, the social mm -hmm. bank, the spiritual mm -hmm. bank. In many ways, we've gone bankrupt in those things because of our focus on the cash bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, before it's too late, I think we in Hawaii have an opportunity to perhaps rethink that or to adopt a, a different focus on the currency that, you know, makes us who we are. Mm -hmm. And I had a kupuna say that that currency is aloha. Uh, how do we get that back into, you know, or forward? Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can go back anywhere, but can we bring it forward? Yeah, can we... yeah that, that, that's the, we, we've got to wrap up. Yeah, I'll, sure. I'll just do with one final good old days yep. quote, and I'm sure you feel the same way. When I was a kid growing up here in Honolulu, we'd, uh, on a Saturday, I'd say, Mom, I'm going to Johnny's house. And she said, okay, be home for dinner. Yep. And we'd get on our bikes, and we'd go all over the place, and we'd go into the ocean, and we'd go into the streams, and we'd, yeah, we'd cut ourselves up a little bit, and that was, we were barefoot, that was fine. Those yeah. were the good old days. Yeah, things and have that, changed. that was much more of an aloha type of spirit. And we could go on and on and on yes, and we on, could. but we do have to wrap up. Thank you so much, Ramsey Town, for thank being you. my honored guest. This has been a delightful, delightful discussion. We an asked more questions than we answered, <laughs> but I hope they were very, very important uh, questions that all of us can think about some more. That does it for Think Tech Hawaii, Howard Wig, Code Green. See you next time. Oh.